Welcome to the Hoopologist podcast. My name is Safe Basaria. And my name is Asa Balani. And joining us today is Pat Benson, the troublemaker himself, the problem child himself of Hawks Twitter and Sports Illustrated, of course. Pat, thank you for coming back on the show and welcome back, brother. Hey, thanks for having me. I had to take a break from subtweeting Chris Kirshner to, to hop <laughs> on here, but I figured I could squeeze y'all into my busy schedule. I, I think us and I feel incredibly honored that we're allowed to be here with you today, Pat. <laughs> no, man, it's the other way around. I really, I really rock with y'all's podcast. Y'all, y'all know hoops, you know, y'all know ball. So uh, it's my pleasure. The pleasure is all mine. Appreciate the love and appreciate you coming back. So since the last time you came on, Pat, we were yeah. the Waterboy and Equipment Manager podcast. We've now rebranded to the Hoopologist podcast. I like Do it. you like the new name? Yeah, no, I like it because I think y'all were selling yourselves too short with the previous name. Y'all, like I said, y'all really know hoops, y'all know ball. And uh, I uh, brought up, uh, who was it? It was like a Denver Nuggets player. Compazzo, I think it was. Yeah, Facuna Compazzo. Yeah, 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 exactly. And y'all knew like right off the bat. I was like, okay, these guys know their stuff. So <laughs> no, I, I think the new podcast name is super appropriate. Appreciate and like I said, I'm hyped to be on here. Awesome. Well, listener, hopefully you enjoy Pat being on here. And if you're a new listener, hopefully you'll enjoy us as well as Pat, because you probably already like Pat's work. So obviously Pat's expertise is in basketball, specifically the Atlanta Hawks, who are currently down 2-0 to the Miami Heat as we talk today. By the time you listen to this listener, things could be different. Hopefully they are uh, in a positive Atlanta Hawks way. But in the meantime, uh, Pat, the Hawks are down 2-0. What are your initial thoughts? What have you seen from the Hawks that you like, but more importantly that you hope they fix? And then we'll get to the heat in a minute. So I like the energy from game two. Obviously game one, we knew they were coming in exhausted. It was a quick turnaround. They looked flat. I really didn't expect much out of game one. Game two, the energy looked much better. Uh, they made some adjustments. It's it's clear that the Miami Heat are going to try to take the ball out of Trey Young's hands. And uh, it's just it's up to him to trust his teammates. It's up, for, it's up to them to knock down open shots. And despite being down 0-2, this, this series is far from over. So I like the adjustments they've made between games. I like the... Uh, the energy in the second game. And I think the energy is going to be through the roof uh, in games three and four in Atlanta. And that's why I think they're going to take both games. I hope so, man. I hope you're right. Let's uh, jump in here. Talk to me. What do you think yeah. about the Hawks so far? They, I think I definitely agree with Pat with, with game one, where after playing two, you know, they played at home in an intense, well, it was intense for three quarters and they blew out Charlotte. Yeah. Uh, and then Cleveland was obviously was, was a grind. And then obviously losing Capella is a big injury as well now. Right. And where I'm going with this is that was kind of the theme coming into this series is, you know, now that we don't have Clint, you know, holding down the paint, we lose our best interior defender and rebounder. Mm -hmm. uh, JC is not hundred percent. He is now starting at the five. Um, well, JC is a good rebounder in his own right, but he's not Clint. And we don't have necessarily the, the size that we've had the entire regular season where we've used that to our advantage. Right. One of the good things about the Hawks is, that combo of JC and Clint dominating the boards, and especially the offensive glass and creating second opportunities and more shots for the team. So, you know, how do you think the Hawks combat that? Can JC step up? Does Onyeka Okongwu need to step up? How do we, you know, turn that advantage, you know, maybe back to in our direction for the rest of the series? That's a million dollar question, man. I, there's just no replacing what Capella does defensively and on the boards as much as we love Okongwu. And I do believe he is the center of the future. He's still not quite ready to fill in for Capella yet. He's still second year player. He's still super young. John Collins, you know, as you mentioned, he's coming back from injury as well. Minutes restrictions. I'm actually surprised at how many minutes he's been playing in both games. But for not playing since March 11th, he really doesn't have much rust. I think obviously his finger's still bothering him. It looks like he's lacking a little explosion uh, still with that foot injury as well. Uh, yeah, I don't know what the answer is, but uh, either way, I, I trust um, whenever, whenever John Collins is out on the court, I, I trust that he's going to make the right decisions and he's going to play hard. And really, that's all you can hope for at this point. I think, unfortunately, the Hawks season has been a concerning one in that John Collins recently said, we, we got a quote from him, right? He said, I don't think I'll feel a hundred percent anytime soon. And I think yeah. that that coupled with the Capella injury um, look Hawks, Twitter, obviously listener, if you're, if you're coming as a Hawks fan, you're familiar Hawks. Twitter is, is very passionate and very, very extreme to the right, very extreme to the left 
on how the feelings are on certain players and things. Yeah. And, and that turns into, in my opinion, very good insight to the fan base as a whole. It allows us to see where they're at. And one thing I read on Hawks Twitter literally this morning, and I apologize because I'm forgetting the name and I would love to credit you. Uh, so if it was you, thank you. Um, but it was simply that Trey Young is a pick and roll point guard and he's missing his pick and roll partner. Mm -hmm. And it shows, it shows, yeah. it, I mean, there's no replacement to Capella right now, which is quite unfortunate, but it is what it is. And, and obviously uh, I saw your tweet, Pat, going <laughs> straight Jordan rules on, on Trey Young right now. And it's, yeah. Are we, are yeah. we biased? I'm, I'm concerned because I don't want, I, we try really hard to stay objective as possible. It feels like they're a little physical with Trey Young and a lot has been getting away <laughs> with. And again, if, if I don't want to come off biased, but it sure feels like they're coming for his head. Quite literally, right, so he's been hit in the head multiple times. A, a couple things. One, uh, I stand by my original tweet, but it got real spicy, mostly because <laughs> it was slightly ahistorical. Like, yeah, I get it. Like, I get it. The Pistons did have success with the Jordan rules. I tweeted it out in a hurry, and everybody's like, well, actually, just so you know, everybody's sending me pictures. I'm like, I get it. Stop sending it to me. They they won two championships. The, the Jordan rules worked initially, but then they failed. So I've been meaning to say that for a few days, but I'm not going to give them the pleasure. I don't think you need to retract it. I don't think you yeah, yeah, they don't, they don't need the, I'm not going to give them the pleasure on Twitter. They can listen to this podcast if they want to hear it. So <laughs> yeah, to, to me, yeah, I think they absolutely came out swinging. They're going to set the tone. They're going to try to punk out Trey Young. That's not going to work. So then they, they move on. They try DeAndre Hunter. I don't know what Kyle Lowry was doing the other night. Very that interesting was, tactic. Yeah, very interesting tactic for sure. And I thought it was beneath him as a veteran, as an NBA champion. I expected more out of him. If you want to play physical, you know, okay, that's fine. But all the flailing and flopping is ridiculous. So I don't know, man. They're just – they're trying everything to throw this Hawks team uh, out of sorts. But I don't think they realize that this team is so cerebral. They're so zen, like too zen for their own good. So it's not going to work. Yeah. So that... I was going to – so hold on. So I just want to jump in. One thing I wanted to talk to you about, you said it was a little beneath Kyle Lowry. And I mean this with all due respect, especially if you're Miami Heat fan or if you're Kyle Lowry listening. It's not in that Kyle Lowry has always done what is necessary to win. Sometimes that is very annoying for the opposing team. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that comes off as, uh, as, as a little cheap shoddy or dirty. That's not who he is, obviously, but he does mm -hmm. what's necessary. And it did lead to an awesome career so far and an NBA championship in Toronto. I, I want to refer to, I was like, I think I know one of his nicknames, but I wasn't 100% sure. So I went on the basketball reference. It's Bulldog. People literally yeah. call him Bulldog. Yeah. And so that's kind of what he does. And he's playing against a generally young team, right? DeAndre Hunter is still young, even though he's what, 23, 24. Um, Trey Young, obviously even younger than that. He's going to punk them because they kind of have to earn their stripes. And it sucks that they have to earn their stripes after making an Eastern Conference run last year, right? An East Conference Finals run. But this Miami Heat team we knew was going to be tough. And they've proven to be such... Uh, so you want to jump in? Yeah. The, the point that I was going to make is the, you know, watching this series and from like the, the Hawks perspective, you know, the, the Kyle Lowry stuff kind of comes to light and especially from, from our side of what we're seeing on, on Hawks Twitter and things like that. But this is nothing new for Kyle Lowry. Kyle Lowry has always done, had these antics. Maybe they were overshadowed in Toronto, you know, with, with obviously Kawhi Leonard there, them winning a championship, you know, the city loves him and, and deservedly. So he's a great player. No, no slight to him whatsoever, but Kyle's always done this, the, the dirty kind of scrappy stuff, mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the Patrick Beverly esque antics, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, there, I, this is I, Patrick Beverly's father, Kyle Lowry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Cause at least, at least one is successful. Yeah. <laughs> Damn. I don't uh, fuck with Pat Bev. I'm sure, it, look, he don't fuck with me either. It's, it's all dude. He don't even know who I am. So if still. anything, he's still winning. <laughs> yeah. So it, it is, it is what it is. And, I, I think that it is good. It's good practice and a good growth opportunity for the Hawks. And I, Trey, I think, came out and said this too, right? Uh, I think he had a recent quote, uh, I think either yesterday or even earlier today, where he's like, you know, yeah, I know we're down 0 2, but this is, this is good, a good opportunity for me playing, you know, in this chess match, which co with, with Coach Spo, you know, who's arguably top three, top two coach in the league, uh, one of my favorites personally as well. Um, you know, and Coach Spo doesn't fuck around. So, no. No. Be able to to learn and adjust mid-series 
uh, for, for a player like Trey Young at this point early in his career is only going to do beneficial things for him down the future because we know how spectacular of a player he's going to be even more spectacular than he's been now, right? Yeah. So we're yeah. going to bite our tongues and not talk about the offseason as much as I would like to talk about <laughs> the offseason. We'll wait and we'll bring you back in the offseason to discuss that. Please do. Yeah. Um, because what we could we could do that, I'm sure, all day long. Yeah. But I think I think the first game was very expected. That loss was not too harsh. It was they played a, a game seven basically against Cleveland, what 48 hours, less than 48 hours prior. Um, so you almost couldn't write that off. It's like, okay, shit happens, let's move on. Yeah. Game two, though. T- talk to me about game two. And it looked like for a minute there, the Hawks had the momentum. Bogey was playing well. Obviously, Trey Young doing Trey Young things. The Miami Heat are trying specific Kyle Lowry to get under the skin of the team. It's working, and then it stops working. And they kind of seem to get it together in that third and fourth quarter. With an oper- They had the lead at one point, very close to the end of the game. And then the game kind of got out of hand. What, what happened there? What did you notice from the Hawks' perspective, defensively, offensively? Obviously, Jimmy is Jimmy. But talk to me about what the Hawks did right and wrong there. Yeah, well, besides running into the buzzsaw that is Jimmy Butler, obviously too many turnover, turnovers on offense, and they fought and scrapped their way back into it, had a couple good looks. Uh, I know Trey had a, a look at a decent look at a three to tie it up pretty late. Uh, you know, like you said, uh, Bogey was Bogey was great. He really just doesn't feel the pressure at all. But um, really, I just think it's the Jimmy Butler game, too many turnovers, and it just a few shots rolled out. That's all it was. It could have easily gone the other way. But unfortunately, when you're an eight seed, you can't have any uh, games just uh, tilt the other way. So it, it was definitely a disheartening loss. There are plenty of good things to pull from it. There's some silver linings, but man, you know, a, a couple things bounce the, the Hawks' way, and this is a completely different series. Yeah, for sure. Nate. Think said it in his in his post game conference that when you make have as many turnovers as we do, you do not win a playoff game. So very valid. Other than also Jimmy turning into prime Kevin Durant and making <laughs> fadeaway threes to close out the game. Um, I we were we were talking about it in the group chat while the game was going on, and I was like, this man was shooting eight percent from three at one point in this regular game. Yeah. <laughs> now he's shooting like ninety eight percent from three. I know. I know. So. And there were a couple. I don't know if y'all saw. I'm sure y'all probably did. Y'all know hoops. Is there were a couple miscommunications on switching on Jimmy Butler. He had two like wide open dunks because both of them involved DeAndre Hunter. One was with Bogey and the other was with Trey. And both times resulted in easy dunks. I don't know what happened late in the fourth quarter on either of those uh, defensive uh, plays. Yeah, the we know the Hawks are are very talented offensively, but the growth, you know, not just for this series, but even long term is on the defensive end. And that starts with Trey as well. You know, Trey, as fantastic of a player he is, that's mostly on the offensive side and his defensive capabilities will be criticized forever. And while I don't think that he will be an incredible defender in his NBA career, the goal for him is to at least be an average defender, you know, somewhere on the level of a, of a Stephen Curry, Kyrie Irving, you know, these phenomenal point yeah. guards who are so talented offensively, but can at least, you know, hold their own or at least do what they can. Um, and obviously with Trey Young's size, that has its limitations, but I think it also comes with effort uh, and just positioning and just, you know, knowing in where, what spots to be and where you can at least give yourself a fighting chance to, to get through some of these screens, contest these shots, and honestly just show more effort on the defensive end. I think you hit the nail on the head with effort because when he's locked in, the rest of the team's locked in. And it just makes me wonder how much energy he's expelling on offense to where there's just nothing left on defense. Or maybe it's just an area where he can grow, where he just has to uh, hold himself to a higher level. Because when he's locked in, the rest of the team's been locked in. But when he's lackadaisical on defense, the rest of the team is following suit. So, Pat, uh, you've been accused of being a fan of the Atlanta Hawks (laughs) while also covering them. Yeah. Um, uh, quite recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're going to we're going to ask you real quick. What do you yeah. think about the rest of the series? How does it end? And, and are we calling it a summer? Are we calling one, two, three Cancun on the Hawks before this is all said and done? You know, obviously, if I were a betting man, I would probably say that the, uh, the wise bet would be on the Miami Heat at this point. I'm not going to say the series is over. Talk to me after game four. I think there's a real possibility it's going back to Miami tied 2-2, in which case I think Heat, Heat culture, everybody in my Twitter mentions are all shitting their pants. And I think that's a real possibility. And I think, so, Pat, you'll sleep very good at night if that's the case. Oh, man, I'll just be obnox- so obnoxious on Twitter. <laughs> but, uh, I look forward to it. I look, yeah, I look so very I, much forward to it. I mean, obviously, smart money right now is on Miami. But let's see how these next two games go. If it goes back to Miami 2-2, all bets are off. 
Fair enough. All right, let's jump into the rest of the NBA as a whole. Obviously, yeah. listener, if you haven't heard, there's other playoff series to be talked about and, and arguably some way more fun the way they've been going yeah. so far. What so far has been your favorite series to watch besides, obviously, the Hawks and Heat, Pat? I mean, I'm sure I sound like a casual, but it's been Boston, Brooklyn. It, it's been it's so exciting. Casual, it's been fun. It's okay, been yeah, it's been yeah, it's been exciting, and uh, the, the whole the storylines of Kyrie going back to Boston, and obviously Ben Simmons still hasn't played. I heard he's uh, anticipating making his debut soon. So, uh, you know, I love the drama, of course. So uh, that's been a super, and and the hoops have been great as well. Obviously, it's been cool. I'm not a Celtics fan, but it's cool to see Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown playing well and uh, show that they are capable of winning. And this, who knows, it could be their year. The Celtics went from a team that we almost wrote off in January yeah. to, I mean, there's a real shot there. They're in the finals a month from now. It's very possible. Yeah. Look, as a Laker fan, I would love for it to not happen because fuck the yeah. Celtics. Yeah. But realistically, they are very, very good, especially in the defensive end. Kevin Durant has really struggled in the series so far, Pat. What do you think? Is Katie going to get it together? I mean, it's Kevin Durant. So the, an- the easy answer is yes. But yeah. what is he going to do differently to get it together? Because it's not like he's he's getting shots. He's getting what would otherwise be Kevin Durant decent looks. Mm-hmm. What's going on? That's the thing, man. We're just not used to seeing this from KD. It's not he's he's too young for his body to you know to be breaking down or slowing down. He's not at that level yet. It's just I guess he's hitting a slump at the worst possible time. And the way this team is constructed, I mean, outside of Kyrie, not a whole lot of help uh, for KD, at least not until Ben Simmons returns. So they can't afford to have him have anything less than a stellar night. So just really an opportune time for a slump for KD. I'm going to push my uh, my James Harden agenda here a little bit. Let's hear uh, it. I'm ready for it. Because Disgusting. obviously. Disgusting. <laughs> okay. But look, my point is with this is James Harden was the facilitator on that team. Now that you take James Harden out of the equation, you know, Kyrie and KD are running their ISOs. They are not dynamic playmakers. They're not one to really initiate the offense. They're just phenomenal one-on-one scorers. So there's not as much ball movement as there was before. Obviously now with Ben Simmons coming back, the hope is that, you know, he can be the one to at least facilitate the offense for the 15, 20 minutes that I'm sure he'll start off playing with. But now that you take away that, that guy to, to keep the offense moving, ball becomes stickier and Boston is too good of a defensive team to, you know, you're not going to beat them that way. And that that's clearly shown in the first two games. Also with, with KD, KD is always one of those guys where he's just so long and so talented that to a certain point, guys who guard him, they do what they can. And at the, at at the end of the possession, they just put their hands in the air and pray to God that he misses the shot. That's it. And Right. And I think that's what's happening is, that, you know, KD's, KD takes a lot of these shots normally and he just makes them. And so everyone mm-hmm. is like, you know, used to it. And so now that, you know, they're, the Celtics are making him a little bit uncomfortable and making him take tougher shots. Um, they're still makeable shots because it's KD. So yeah. I do expect them to, to go in in Brooklyn. Uh, my, my prediction for this series was that this would go seven and mm-hmm. I'm not budging off of that. I don't oh, wow. think that that's going to change. Oh, wow. Well, no, I like it coming in spicy. I disagree with you. I said only yeah. because... Boston, as we've if we've seen, they switch everything now, right? And so I think this is abs- Kevin Durant playing badly or not to Kevin Durant levels, supernova levels is by design. It's not because he's missing shots. Yeah. Boston is contesting everything and mm-hmm. constantly. He went 0 for 10 in the second half last night, not because he missed 10 shots because they were all Kevin Durant bad looks or good looks or whatever. It's because Boston is there and Boston's there all the time. They're competing on both ends of the floor. Jason Tatum, I believe the stat I read was Kevin Durant is two for 12 or two for 13 when shooting against Jason Tatum. Uh, And Jason Tatum has obviously, we don't consider him one of the best defenders in the league, but he's been good this year. And he's been really, really good these playoffs so far simply by trying and giving a shit. He's got the frame to do it. We know this, right? So from a defensive standpoint, Boston has been something different. Pat. Is this going seven? Because you made a face when us had said this might be going seven still. I, I, I was surprised to hear him de- take that detour. I don't know, man. I think I think Boston might be in control of the series, but I think you did hit the nail on the head when you're talking about Boston's defense. They're an elite defense, and then they go out and they add Derek White at the trade deadline, which further you know uh, solidified this uh, defensive mentality, this defensive mindset that they have. So. 
I don't know, man. I, I'm really drinking the Boston Kool Aid. I think between that, watching hey, you're a Lakers time, fan, damn it. I, I know, but watching <laughs> Come winning on. Time on HBO now, the Leprechauns in my head. I'm like, maybe, maybe it'll <laughs> pop up. I don't know if you've seen the newest episode. Of course I have. Of course. Oh, I have. Okay, good. Oh uh, man, that scary I, laugh. And I, that's exactly how, like, as a kid, that's how I imagined it too. I was like, oh, that little evil. A yeah. maniacal laugh you know yeah. oh no so no man I'm, I'm totally brainwashed all right let's go to the west real quick because uh, i i think we we'd be unbiased we'd be biased if we didn't at least talk about yeah. the western conference obviously of the four series in the west what's been the most fun so far what's maybe surprised you so far to see man i'm gonna be honest i've not watched many western conference games i'm uh, walking late. to the east Pat, you're I'm an old walking. man you get uh, that. <laughs> that's it i'm an old man i told you i was like i got to get to bed early tonight i haven't watched that much western conference hoops uh i guess the main storyline that's really stuck out to me has been jordan Poole. i think that's been we go and say that's been yeah. cool like uh, that one stuck out to me and uh i was surprised the other night to see new orleans steal a game that, that was really cool. So I think that gives the Hawks hope for sure. So haven't really kept up the wet with the Western Conference as much as the Eastern Conference. But I mean, uh, I think it was Carl Anthony Towns who said the Western Conference is a swamp and only uh, Gators crawl out. So uh, that's the way to, I have no idea who's going to win the Western Conference. I don't like that you quoted Cat of all people. Well, you don't like Cat? <laughs> I, I'm, 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 yes, I'm running an anti cat agenda right now, actually. <laughs> oh, it's I mean, here. Oh, oh, I know the listener safe to tell you. Tell us how you really feel. I don't, yeah, fuck with cat. Look, look, okay. For the last two years, look, cat has had a really tough couple years. And so I empathize with him That's human it. to human. So yeah. when I say this, listener, I only basketball hate him as a person. Absolutely rooting We're for, all for to just Yeah, it's like, I'm rooting for you to have a great life. I hope the rest of your life is fantastic. Yeah. But I basketball hate the guy. Yeah. And, and I don't like the, all the, the flabbergast, the blabbling that he's been doing <laughs> yeah. on the basketball court. Because yeah. did we just forget that this guy has no real NBA success in his entire career, but he's talking like he's freaking LeBron James or something. It's like, bro, what are you doing? Like, do win up like a playoff series in your whole career. Can we, can yeah. we do that before we start talking like we're him? It, it's Pat Bev rubbing off on him. At least Pat That's Bev it. has more success than Cat does. It's like Pat Bev's one more playoff series than Cat has. Fair enough. Yeah. That different roles, understandable. But I just I can't get behind Cat. And on top of that, to top all of this off, right? This guy is supposed to be the best player on this team. He has been usurped by a 21 year old who is a. <laughs> Come on, Cat. Ant is better than you. Ant is the number one in this basketball team. You are not. You are not number one anymore. It is Ant. You are number two, and that's a role you're going to have to live with because in a play-in scenario where you have to show up because your whole life was on the line, you decided to foul out. And, and D'Angelo Russell had to carry you to the finish line for you to even be here today. So, yeah, right. I don't like all the talking. I'm not a fan of it. Man, that, that, was, that was such a hot take. All right, so now we, we got to go to an impartial uh, juror. I want to hear, <laughs> hear your take on the – Cat is number two because I, I don't know if I believe I don't know if I'm ready to believe that yet. Do I think don't think so. Awesome? I don't think so either. I I think that the gap is closer than maybe it was before, kind of coming into the season. Obviously, seeing yeah. Ant's, Ant's growth as a scorer and the game really slowing down for him. Mm -hmm. I still do think though that a lot of the Chris Finch sets, their team sets, run through Cat, and Cat is the focal point of that offense. Whether or not he's taking as many shots as as Anthony Edwards is a different story. But I think it's because the defenses are keying in on him. Uh, and obviously, in this in that first round series with Memphis, Jaron Jackson Jr., who has had a tremendous defensive year, is has been guarding has been guarding Cat. So there's more mm -hmm. defensive attention on him versus you know like I guess Dylan Brooks and you know Desmond Bain are out there on on Edwards, but I don't buy into Dylan Brooks hype. I'm I'm, I'm anti Dylan Brooks. So for whatever. <laughs> But, He's got his Dylan Brooks agenda, like I got my cat agenda. Yeah, so. we all have an agenda, and you have a Chris <laughs> Krishna agenda. It is what it is. <laughs> We all have a shit he's, list. He's never coming on this podcast. I've completely, also, I apologize. That's that's just me being an ass, Chris. Uh -huh. I got nothing against you. I'm just having fun with the moment. I, it's I hope all you good. Oh, uh, uh, I think I think that per, I think that presents a natural a natural pivot. segue. I, yeah, I think we're screwed, Not guys. Um, so Pat, you have been uh, quite famous on Hawks Twitter in the last few days. <laughs> interestingly yeah. enough uh do you want to recap it or should i recap it what do you prefer no i want to hear your version of it <laughs> okay yeah. fair enough so uh more or less from what what i understand chris yeah. kirshner also covers the atlanta hawks for the athletic listener if yeah. you're not fully caught up now you are pat sports illustrated atlanta hawks chris uh athletic atlanta hawks so they are co-workers and from my understanding you had a reasonably good relationship with him and yeah. i assume you probably still have a 
relationship with him. Uh, I can't say that because <laughs> I don't know. I haven't asked you about it. This is me asking yeah. you now. Yeah. Um. So Chris Kirshner uh, has a vote for the all NBA teams. Is, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Which is kind of cool. Like how crazy it's is very that dope. That he has a vote. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I wonder how he got that. I mean, not, not in the sense that he doesn't deserve it. Simply that I think it's very cool that he has it. Yeah. yeah. Um. So Chris put, Trey Young on the All NBA third team is in a guard spot, and mm -hmm. put John ja Morant on the All NBA second team uh, in a guard spot. Now, listener, maybe you haven't heard our All NBA takes here. Uh, I actually don't have a problem with that, uh, but I don't have a vote, listener, and uh, neither does us. Uh, and apparently, neither does Pat. Um, but, <laughs> no, but Pat they won't did... give me one. <laughs> well, I, maybe they will now. Yeah, maybe maybe. You, you've gotten some notoriety in the last couple of weeks, Pat. Yeah. Who knows? Um, uh, Pat then went on Twitter at some point, uh, and decided to say, uh, something along lines of, you know, how about them apples after, after Trey Young does some really awesome stuff. Chris, by the I, way, did pick I against, have, the I Hawks. have the quote up. I have yeah, let's pull up the okay. quote. Pull up um, the quote. Chris <laughs> did pick against the Hawks against the Hornets and against the Hawks when they played against the Cavaliers in both of those playing scenarios. So for whatever reason, he was anti Hawks and maybe that's just him being impartial. I don't know. Now I said, yes, the quote would be great. So that leads into Pat's quote um, or Pat's tweet, um, you know, last last Wednesday, I believe it was. Uh, and he said, imagine covering the Atlanta Hawks for 82 games and then voting John Morant over Trey Young for all NBA SMH. <laughs> so that one that one did numbers. Like, I'm not going to lie. Yeah, it did. <laughs> yeah, it did. That one, that one. So, just so took what off. was going through your mind? What, what were you thinking when you sent this tweet out? Obviously, yeah. what ended up happening, I assume you didn't expect that to happen. No. Um, but no. what was it going on in your mind at the time when you sent it off? Man, I was working out. I, I was just chilling, uh, working out, lifting some weights. You know, pulling out my phone on you know in between sets, and uh, I was on Hawks Reddit, and somebody was like, "Man, I can't believe Chris Kirshner uh, voted John Morant put John Morant second team, Trey Young third team." I was like, "Nah, that can't be right." So I People went. People just back walk and, up to you in the gym and are like, "Hey, let's talk basketball." No, oh, <laughs> hey, you no. made it, man. You've made it. You no, have. I haven't you been recognized one time. I've been, I, I don't think I have any clout because I haven't been recognized one time. So yeah, I was just you know pulling out my phone. I read that on Reddit. I was like, "Nah, that can't be right." So I went back and double checked. It was right. And now, you know, when you're working out, like you're heated, your blood pressure's up. And uh, so, yeah, man, uh, that was the tweet. So now let's continue. I want to continue to hear your version. Do you, of do you have the, uh, so then obviously Pat fires this tweet off. Um, malicious or not, it was received in a very malicious manner. <laughs> it was um, also, not do you have well. the exact tweet in response? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll pull it up in a, right. I'll pull it up in a okay. second. Yeah. Uh, so, so Chris basically... Well, first off, actually, let's talk about the response before Chris responds. Hawks Twitter, just Hawks fans, basketball fans, responded to you, like you said, Pat, in quite numbers. What are kind of the sentiments you got? I, I know you got a lot yeah. of, hey, we back you, and then you also got a, you're a crazy old man. Sure. So, yeah, so kind of yeah, what did yeah, you get from sure. that? So um, I think the overwhelming majority agree with me. You know, no surprise, they're Hawks fans. That's fine. But uh, I think a lot of people immediately – thought of it as this dude's holding a grudge against Trey Young because of like a little Twitter skirmish they had earlier in the season. Chris told one of his readers, he just said something like flippant, like uh, something about subscription fees. Like if you're just, just say you're broke and move along. And then Trey Young picked that up and like quote tweeted him. as like, who says this sort of thing? And, you know, they, uh, I think a lot of people immediately thought, wow, this dude's using his NBA vote uh, to settle a score or something like that. So I think that was, uh, you see, you see a lot of that in the mentions, you see people immediately like adding him mm -hmm. <laughs> at Chris Kirshner. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I mean, I think everybody was like, fight, fight, fight. And so maybe it's not, maybe Asad's got the uh, tweet. Before we, before we go there, I want to know, and you don't have to answer this because, like no. I said, I don't want to get you any more. Trouble. I'll answer anything, brother. I, we, we're a family. Now, I know you will, but that's why I feel bad. Like I feel like it's my responsibility to protect you. To protect moments. me from like myself. This. It's like I don't want to put you in a bad position. I don't you're want good. to play this gotcha journalism, but I do want to know what you're thinking, right? So you, you send off the tweet. Obviously, uh, you get a lot of responses. One of them kind of comes to mind that maybe he is using a vote to settle a score or be based on his prior conversation with yeah. Trey Young or, or yeah. whatever. Mm -hmm. Did that ever cross your mind? Was it ever something you thought about? Or was it Twitter that kind of brought that to your attention or maybe reminded no. you of that having happened? No, I honestly, I agree with the people who are saying that. I thought he was trying to settle a score. Uh, so it is something that was kind of maybe in the back of your mind when you saw what you did. 
well, as far yeah. as his, his uh, award voting goes. Yeah, because I know I know Chris is a smart guy. He's a good writer, and I know he knows hoops. And uh, I think John Morant played like twenty less games than Trey, and the Grizzlies were better without him. They were like eighteen and two or something without him. And obviously, Trey leads the league in total points and total assists in uh, most of the categories. And uh, you know, everybody's got their own argument. He's got a vote. That's cool. But to me, I was like, wow, this uh, is right on time. And it also aligned with him picking uh, the the Cavs to beat the Hawks in the play-in tournament. And I don't know, it just it, it just struck a certain way with me. And uh, more than anything, I was like, man, this is on the heels of Trey Young just going off this season. He dragged this team through the regular season, and you're there every night witnessing greatness. And this is what you come away with. So that that's where I came from. But obviously, me, I'm passionate, and like you said, uh, like. Uh, and I'll say proudly, I'm a fan, and it bleeds through, you know, and I can be irrational at times. So that, that that's where I was coming from. All right, I said, Chris responds. <laughs> I said, Chris yeah. responds to Pat's tweet, and Chris says, If you want to be loud on Twitter and subtweet me, have some balls and at me next time. <laughs> I didn't hear shit when I was one of the two people who voted him all NBA last season. Sorry, I'm not a fanboy like you. To what Pat responded was uh, LMAO crying emoji, which was <laughs> – fucking awesome thank you thank you <laughs> i'm gonna be honest i saw i saw the tweet or that that chris obviously responded to you and then i was like i don't know how i would respond in this moment because you can choose to engage more and you mm-hmm. can take this to another level i'm sure you could uh or you could do what you did which is basically kind of troll the guy you were just like oh no you know hands up waving it oh no and and then that's it it. and it kind of kills it and i think uh, look it's professionalism at its finest in the best way that you could um you trolled him and you kind of kill the conversation because now in my opinion if he keeps going he sounds like the asshole uh even though you did poke the bear to begin with (laughs) so tell me what were you thinking he tweets what he did you obviously it hits you uh, maybe the blood is still flowing. Maybe you're like, oh, what do I do? Maybe the anxiety comes in. I don't know. Um, no, so yeah. what, are you, what are you thinking? You, no, you did the science on that. That's that's all exactly right. Um, so I uh, see that he responds. I'm like, and for, for like a split second, I'm like, there's no way this dude, like why is dude talking about my balls on Twitter? Like, <laughs> What the fuck? <laughs> like, that's the first thing. I was like, I no way Chris Kirshner just quote tweeted me. He's talking about my balls. What? So that was like the very first thing. And then like immediately I was like, say something crazy. And then I was like, no. I was like, no, 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 no. I was like, Don't do that. Don't do like that. Like what? Please. Like what? Um, like what, what kind of crossed your mind? You were like, I could say this and really oh, start like I, I stoke mean, the fires. Yeah. Like per- personal stuff. Like, mm. and I was like, no, nah, that's a horrible. Fair look. enough. Fair enough. That's a horrible look for anybody. Like, uh, so I was like, don't, don't be personal. Like that's nasty. And I, there's plenty of material you can come at me personally as well. And I was like, don't lose, like, don't lose your job over some shit. Don't say something like I'm going to fuck you up. <laughs> like that, <laughs> Fair that, enough. Yeah. Like, yeah, like that. I think I get arrested if I like threaten somebody. <laughs> and I was like, don't okay. lose like your media pass, that sort of thing. And like all the meanwhile, like people are tweeting, like, damn, Pat, you gonna say something? I'm like, it's been one minute, shit. <laughs> Twitter so, is relentless. Yeah. Twitter yeah, is relentless, so, man. Yeah, so like, Derek, I couldn't go out like that. Couldn't be me. <laughs> I was like, damn, that took no time. So I basically was like, I'm gonna drop, I'm gonna diffuse it, I'm gonna drop the ratio. My laughing emoji's got more like yeah, it does. Yeah, I'm gonna does. take I'm gonna take a victory, a win by decision for like a boxing metaphor. Like mm-hmm. I'm not gonna try to go for a knockout blow. Like I could go for it, try to go for a knockout, but maybe I could leave myself open to a counter punch or something I don't see coming. So I'm gonna just dead it. I'm gonna take the win by decision. Let let the judges score it how they want. But I know I walked right with the victory. And it was it was a pretty nice little troll. I am I mean, obviously not, didn't think it was going to escalate that quickly. I mean, it really got out of hand fast. So uh, I'll see him tomorrow for the first time. Down That's what I was going to ask. I was like, tomorrow's the first time you're going to see him uh, since the whole Twitter thing. Do you guys generally prior to this, have you guys spoken? Do you talk? Do you have any relationship with Chris besides obviously the, the I'm sure the, the ever so often nod in the hallway kind of thing? It's mostly a nod in the hallway, but it was sad that it kind of came to this because um he was one of the first people like when I announced I got this job on Twitter like he shouted me out he's like hey congrats way to go and uh you know 
and I've retweeted some of his work before. He had a really dope um, story on Onyeka Kongwu and like the story of his father. And so, I mean, obviously I'm sad for it to see it go like this. I stand by my tweet, both of them know. So I, I think I think it's all good. But if, if I mean, if Chris Kirshner tries to put his hands on me tomorrow, I then y'all know it's, imagine, it's clearly, yeah, it's clearly I can't imagine good. it's it's that serious. You, yeah, you both sure. have had about a week now to sit I on it. We're good. Besides talking to us about it, I can't imagine you're thinking about it all too much. I'm sure Chris isn't either. Um, exactly. I'm sure we both we both moved on, and uh, it's all it's all good, man. I um I mean I got like 200 followers off of it. And, <laughs> <laughs> it you know, it's uh, it's all good, and uh, and I stand by what I said. Trey Young should um, I think he should be first team. So back to my original point. <laughs> that, that, that's where I stand with it. Okay, if you say so. And, and Trey, <laughs> yeah. if you're listening, I think so too. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, but no, I think I think it, I think it's all good. Just a fun little day on Twitter. It sure sounds like it was. Uh, before we get out of here, Pat, I know you got to go, and we're running yeah. a little light on time. Mm-hmm. Um, if if Chris were listening right now, was yeah. there anything you'd say to Chris right now? Um, no, not really. I guess I mean, it's cool. Uh, I'm just asking to leave it open there for you to see if there's anything. No, I mean, I would just say it's all it's all good. I I didn't take any offense. Um, Sorry if you took any offense, but I think I think it's all good. So, um, but he's right. I'm loud on Twitter, man. That's that, 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 that's the way it goes. Like I'm I'm coming from Chattanooga, Tennessee. I shouldn't be here. I'm white trash from Tennessee. Like I'm coming up swinging, and everybody can catch. Everybody can get some. So except for my boys, except for my boys on the Hoopsologist podcast, y'all. Hey, y'all appreciate good. your time, Pat. Right. And as always, hopefully we have a reason to enjoy more Hawks games coming up in the future. Hopefully you have a good time in the next couple of games. I know State Farm Arena, uh, and, and us, and I like to call it Phillips Arena because that's what it is to us yeah, yeah. um is going to be loud and i hope that they deliver their part in what trey young and the hawks are asking them to do and i hope the hawks reciprocate back yeah man absolutely i'm sure it's gonna be a blast i think they're gonna come out too too and then y'all gonna have to have me back on soon oh, we will. i know it's worry. rude but i'm inviting myself so uh, <laughs> Anytime, i'm extending man. an invitation to myself to return here shortly so you y'all, y'all Look, know how if, to find me if they go back over the weekend too too we might have to have like a sunday night monday night you know uh, emergency yeah. pod just a 30 minute thing and put it out there listeners so just keep an eye on that absolutely. if it ends up as a 4-0 Maybe we'll wait to the off season to have that back <laughs> on, or we'll talk about other basketball. Yeah. Uh, but I, I look four zero. I don't see happening. Hopefully, two uh, two is great. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. In the meantime, listener, uh, the next time you hear from us, we'll have uh, Shaban and Kays on, and we're doing three things we've learned from the first round of the playoffs so far. Uh, and then Pat, thank you so much for joining us as always, listener. Thank you for listening. Hopefully, you're staying around with us for the second half of this episode. All right, listener, we're back, and uh, Pat has now left us, and we've got Kays and Shaban here with us. Um, yep. Here they are. Um, I didn't do this before, so I'll do it now in, in the hopes that you're still listening, listener, after the whole Pat segment, at Hoopologist on Instagram and Twitter and uh, the Hoopologist on YouTube.com to, to find us. And I'm still getting used to that. That's really all it is, listener. Just give me a couple weeks. I'll be there. I promise I will. Now, today what we're doing with the four of us is we're going to talk about three things or ish, two and a half things that we've learned from the first round of the playoffs so far or that our takeaways are. And the first one has to be the Golden State Warriors. Are they for real? Like, does this is this a championship caliber team? Uh, would you argue maybe favorites in the West, favorites of the whole damn thing? Uh, Asad, let's start with you, bro. What do you think? Warriors? Legit? They're, they're legit. Um, and I think in terms of your, are they favorites question with, you know, now with Phoenix and what's going on with their, with their injuries, what I had saw was that Phoenix and Golden State are now tied and with the best championship odds at the moment. So clearly Vegas, Vegas thinks so as well. And a lot of the Warriors success comes now to their uh, previously unofficial, now official splash bro in Jordan Poole. Jordan Poole has been flat out phenomenal in their in their two games in the playoffs and he's been phenomenal all season. You know, going to what we talked about in the preseason when we we're doing our predictions, I had Jordan Poole uh, as a candidate for most improved player. He wasn't recognized in the top 3, which I think is a little bit of blasphemy and he might have taken that personally looking at his performance now, but he's been balling. He's averaging 29 and a half points, 5 and a half assists. 66% shooting from the field and 59% from three 
in the first two games of this playoff series on eight and a half attempts. So he's, he's letting them fly and he's not scared and they've been going down. So I'm interested to see what happens now when he goes to the road and, you know, they're not playing in, in golden state uh, or in San Francisco, but he's been phenomenal. Steph is coming off the bench. Steph is cool with that, right? Like he's just like, okay, you know, he's hot. Let him, let him write it. Obviously Steph is coming back from his injury too, but Jordan Poole as the number one factor of, of their playoff success so far. And that's sure. why their death lineup is called yeah. PTSD. <laughs> Poole, Thompson, Steph, just, and Drummond. Just for some extra context. Draymond. Draymond. <laughs> Draymond. Draymond. What? Draymond. I'm what? sorry. <laughs> I was like, I just missed that. I just got off work. It's you got, not ben, a good you got ben Simmons 2.0 on, on your mind. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. But yeah, just for added context, Steph Curry came off the bench in game two played 22 minutes, scored a cool 34 points, hit five threes, and he wasn't even the best player on the floor that night. Like, Jordan Poole had, what, 29 points, nine rebounds, eight assists or something like that? This guy is balling. And you guys put me on the the Ringer's Icon podcast, Mm -hmm. which is really – which, thank you, by the way, because it's very good. I highly recommend it. And one of the things was that – Listener, finish this episode first, then you can go over there. Yeah. (laughs) One of the things is that – Steph personally took Jordan Poole under his wing and all everything that Steph would do with, with his practice routines, with when he showed up to the gym, with his shooting drills, with his diet, he pretty much shadowed Steph the entire year. And Steph essentially made a carbon copy of himself in Jordan Poole. So, and you can see that like the other night in game two, the passes that Jordan Poole was throwing out there this guy is incredible. This guy, it, it, yeah, I agree with us that it's kind of blasphemous that he's not even a finalist for most improved player, but this kid's for real, and so are the Warriors. Would you argue, Shaban, would you call them favorites in the West yet, or are you still pretty okay with Phoenix right now? I'm still okay with Phoenix for now because uh, I guess we'll get we'll get to the uh, what's going on with Phoenix later, but uh, – It'll, it would really all depend on how Phoenix manages uh, the next few games and uh, the next series that comes after the New Orleans series. And that is also, and that whoever they're going up against, that's also up in the air too. So uh, we'll, we'll get see. There. Don't you worry. We'll I, give you I a still, chance to talk about your Mavericks. Don't but worry. But to answer your question, I still like Phoenix as the favorites. Okay. Case, uh, any thoughts on Golden State besides obviously what us other than, and Case, Case, us other than Chauvin have already said? Nothing new, but I can't get any higher on them. I had them going to the finals anyway. You did. You absolutely did. And, and to tie it up, obviously, you consider them the favorites in the West based on 100%. your yeah, your pre-playoff prediction. I'm sure you're going to hold with that. They they look better than advertised at this point in time. And it's yeah. obviously Jordan Poole. But I it's could also not have assumed they would play this well. It's ridiculous in the sense that one thing we talked about prior to the playoff starting was um, with obviously Steph missing time, Clay missing time, Draymond missing time this NBA season. I asked you guys when we talked about it, was it just like riding a bike when they're all on the court together? And at the time, I think most of us kind of said, yeah, probably. And they've proven it right. I mean, it's just like riding a bike. They all fit together. They all play well together. Um, I, I, look, they're fun basketball. And it, I almost feel bad for the Denver Nuggets because obviously if the Denver Nuggets had Jamal Murray or Porter or both, um, I don't think they'd still beat Golden State, but it would be more fun to watch basketball with them. Uh, it'd be a more fun series overall, be more competitive. And right now, I mean, Golden State is just, whenever they want, the runs come. It's not, they, they can turn it off and turn it on. And it's unfair in that this team is an embarrassment of riches. And I think that the next couple rounds will be a lot more fun to watch with them because hopefully those teams will be more healthy, competitive, so on and so forth. But yes, in this case, golden state is for real. And, and I would say that they're the favorites in the Western conference right now, but it's, it's like Shaban, you're going to talk about it probably later. It's disrespectful to Phoenix because they've done it all year. Golden state Mm -hmm. just turned it on basically. Anyway, Let's talk about some of the injuries because that's kind of a big deal. Devin Booker down with a hamstring, Chris Middleton down with an MCL, Luka Doncic still supposedly down with uh, ankle? calf strain, calf strain, calf strain. Calf strain. Scotty Barnes down with an ankle. Um, those are kind of the four major injuries that have played a role in the playoffs so far, or at least we think have played a role in the playoffs so far. Um, so we're kind of kind of jump around and talk about all these things. Us, start us off, man. What what are you thinking? What, who are you covering, or what are you thinking? 
So we'll, let's talk about Chris Middleton because, you know, we, when we talk about Milwaukee and Milwaukee were my, one of my picks to come out of the East, uh, especially coming off their, their run last year and their core was solidified in Giannis, Chris Middleton and Drew Holiday. But now you lose a very, very big piece of that, right? And Chris Middleton is a decent, decent defender, above average defender. But more than that, he's their clutch shot maker. When the game's on the line, the ball is in his hands. Him and Giannis are running pick and roll. Or if you need that last shot to be knocked down, uh, contested, you're going to Chris Middleton. And losing a guy like that, especially in the playoffs, is huge. So in, in yesterday's game two, early in the fourth quarter, he slipped uh, while making a, making a spin move. Uh, what I read was that it was on maybe a sweat, like a sweat stain like on the floor, which is really unfortunate to be injured, especially in something like that. He left the game with knee soreness. They did, they did an MRI and announced that he'll be out for at least two weeks with a sprained MCL and to be evaluated further. They're going to reevaluate him in two weeks. Yeah. The so, timeline's three to four weeks. So the, so the earliest, I mean, the best case scenario is he comes back, what, middle of their round end two? End of next series, or, and, end if of at round all. Two. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So he which would is, probably face, I would assume he would probably have to face Philly. Like the or the Bucks would probably have to face Philly without Chris Middleton. Uh, that's the expectation they, I have. So Milwaukee's the three seed. They would play the winner of of Boston and. Brooklyn. Oh, sorry, no, Boston. I literally had this conversation earlier too. <laughs> so it, regardless of that, it's the, the responsibility now for for Milwaukee and how far they go will one hundred percent be on Giannis and especially Drew Holiday. I think Drew Holiday is the one that has to step up the most here. Obviously, Giannis will do his thing. He's, he's done it before. Chris Middleton has been in and out of the lineup this year with some injuries and some other things. But Drew Holiday, for sure, has got to step up the scoring more so than the defense that he's already been playing phenomenally for the rest of this season. Dave, you're muted, buddy. Sayfu, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, 1-1 Chicago, Milwaukee tied up right now. Before we move on, Asa, does Milwaukee still get out this series? Yeah, I think so. I, I don't think that Chicago has the defensive ability to, to stop Giannis for what five more games. I don't think that happens. I think the series might get drawn out a little bit longer than we had initially predicted, but I'm still picking Milwaukee to come out. Okay. Sounds good. I'm going to stay in the Eastern conference and talk quickly about Scotty Barnes and the Toronto Raptors and the Philadelphia 76ers. Scotty Barnes played game one or played, well, he played 31 minutes in game one. So he pretty much played the majority of the game. Um, and then unfortunately a incident with Joel Embiid in which a very large, Man, Joel Embiid, uh, accidentally, I would like to say, because it seemed very accidental. Uh, it was Still. a basketball play. Yeah, it it's like it, there's nothing dirty about it. It's just unfortunate. Ended up stepping on Scotty Barnes' ankle, and, and it's a severe sprain, I think, is kind of the takeaway I have from this. Grade um, two ankle sprain. Yeah, and it seems as though he's probably going to miss the remainder of at least this round, uh, unless some ridiculous mm-hmm. miracle occurs. Um, yeah, the effect, that's what I would expect, too. The effect, I would say, I don't think the Raptors are go- would have beaten the Philadelphia 76ers in this series, but I do kind of think they would have won this last game in Toronto, game three, if they had Scotty Barnes. Scotty Barnes is obviously an overall good scorer for the Toronto Raptors, but more importantly, his ability is on keeping the ball moving. He's one of their best passers on offense, and he's one of their best defenders, right? Obviously, OG and OB being, I would argue, their best defender. He's probably tied for second with uh, the likes of a Pascal Siakam or a Gary Trent Jr. on the defensive end of the floor. So missing him allows them to be more versatile in offense, and obviously not having him sucks. Um, I think there's a good chance that this series would be 2-1, and maybe after game four, we could be talking 2-2 um, if Scotty Barnes was available and missing him really stinks, but I don't think it will change what we anticipate the outcome of this series to be. I still expect the 76ers to have one, and now they'll probably win marginally sooner. Um, Let's move on to the Western Conference. Obviously, Luka Doncic has now missed two games. Now he'll be missing game three coming into the series as well. They're tied with Utah prior to this, listener. By the time you're listening to this, you'll know the results of that game and potentially the other one after that. Shabon, tell us about what the Mavericks have done, how they've looked without him, and hopefully getting him back soon will mean something different. The Mavericks have looked just about as you've expected them to without Luka Doncic and that they're kind of up and down. Uh, 
They tried game one to play kind of the same way that they played with Luca. Dallas is known for playing very slow and very like very slow pace. They're third, they're last in the league in pace and shots per per, uh, per hundred possessions. Uh, and uh, last game they played very slow and they and one thing that's very surprising about Dallas is that their defense is still keeping up. Utah is a top ranked offense in the entire NBA, and for two straight games, uh, Dallas held them under a hundred points which is pretty, or not under 100 points. Like they under, they held them in 99 points in game one and 104 in game two. This is a team that would consistently score 116, 117, 118, 120 a game. And all a lot of that is con- having to contain Donovan Mitchell and also exposing the rift between Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Gobert. And it's kind of crazy how uh, Donovan Mitchell for this whole season has attempted two passes not assists, two passes to Rudy Gobert per game, which is befuddling to me. But Luca will be out for tonight for game three. He will be back for game four. That's what Dallas is saying. That's what Jason Kidd and, uh, and Dallas and the Mavericks are saying. Uh, they won game two off of Jalen Brunson scoring 41 and Maxi Kleba hitting, I would think, eight threes. So it's a... It's a kind of it's an unpredictable situation right now uh, with Dallas, and uh, they really have to lean into Jalen Brunson and Spencer Dinwiddie a lot more, play a lot more fast-paced offense uh, that they're that they're not used to because Luca plays really slow, and Jalen Brunson and Spencer Dinwiddie they play very quick, very high octane, aggressive offense. So managing that balancing act and kind of staying keeping the ship afloat uh is going to be a key challenge for dallas if luca comes back game four i think dallas takes it in seven but i'm very apprehensive about it understandably so i mean you made it you brought up a really good point with with the donovan rudy thing and the interesting thing about this with is that they asked Donovan Mitchell about it, right? You know, NBA players, they're always on Twitter. They know what's going on. They know the shit that's being said about them. So obviously they asked Donovan Mitchell about it the, the moment it, it got it got big. So, and he was like, we're the, he, de- he deflected it. He didn't really address it. He was like, we're the number one offense in the league. So clearly we're doing something right. Um, you know, I'm always looking for my teammates. I, I'm, a, I'm putting my team ahead of myself. Like, you know, he... He doesn't like Don. He doesn't like Rudy Gobert. It's it's very it's very obvious on the court, and he tried to deflect that in that interview. But I think we all, as NBA fans, have seen it. Donovan Mitchell's been unhappy with the success of of Utah, and and more so, not even the success, their failures in the playoffs over the last few years. And I think Dallas got really lucky that they played. They're playing Utah in this first round. Uh, you know, with this Luka injury, because if it was any other team, I think they might have been kind of fucked. But they might actually survive and make it out of this. I think the beauty is that uh, Utah is mentally weak and Dallas is so far taking advantage of it. We'll see how that goes. Case, arguably the most important. The biggest injury. The yeah. most important injury so far in the play. Obviously, I'd argue Chris Middleton's obviously important, but Devin Booker was an MVP candidate, all NBA first, second, or third teamer here, and he's out with a hamstring for what seems like three or four weeks based on initial reports. So the initial timeline was two to three weeks, and his last hamstring strain was, I think, less than three months ago he missed about 13 games and then while he was out chris paul got hurt so they had this whole thing going on where oh devin's out now chris is out and i think if chris paul had gotten hurt the suns might be okay but i don't see anyone covering for devin booker's 30 points a game like who's gonna step up mikhail bridges cam johnson fucking jay crower as safe likes to say crowded or does Aiden step up which we haven't really seen this year Aiden's just kind of been okay yeah I mean the fact is that like there's nobody on Phoenix that can replicate or recreate the kind of offense so that Devin Booker I think brings. they can't count on one person to replicate it right everyone has to step up and I don't know if everyone will. That's the thing right now. Like, campaign had a historic run last year where he was just playing out of his fucking mind. 
And unless that happens again, Aiton finds a way to be impressive and whatever it is, Phoenix could be in trouble because the Pelicans look fantastic. They, they're keeping it close. We didn't think they would, but they're there. Yeah. The, the thing about, with Phoenix that I think we talked about it when Chris Paul got hurt was that, oh, like, you know, they might suffer, they might drop in the standings, but they just they just kept it rolling. They have such good team chemistry, and Chris Paul is arguably the best leader in the league, right? I think he will find a way to motivate them and be able to get the best out of different guys in different games. It's not going to be the same guy every game, but there's going to be somebody that steps up every game, and I think that they will be able to pull through and at least make it out of the series and hold it down until Devin Booker comes back. I think that this Devin Booker injury and the reason listener we're spending more time on it is because I said it's probably the most important one. Uh, this won't really bother them in this round. It'll suck not having Devin Booker, but Phoenix lost the last game, not because Devin Booker wasn't there, but because the Pelicans shot 56.7% from three. They're oh, not yeah, going to that's They're not going to do yeah. that every single night. They're probably not going to do that again in this entire series. Brendan Ingram had almost 40 at 37 points. Herb Jones had 14. So we're talking about guys who are obviously good basketball players, but Brendan Ingram's probably not going to score 40 every single night or most nights um, as good a scorer as he is. This one team knows how to defend him and defend him well. Um, so yes, I do think DeAndre Ayton will step up on the offensive end. I think he's just going to level up on defense. I think the whole team is going to level up on defense with the Mikel Bridges and Cam Johnsons and Jay Crowd as of the world. Um, so no, I think they'll get out of this series. Maybe instead of in five, they'll get out in six, but I think they'll get out of this series. I'm definitely more concerned about the next round, whether they play what I would argue would be probably by then a healthy or semi-healthy Mavericks team or definitely a healthy or semi-healthy jazz team those will pose as significant threats where they'll definitely want Devin Booker back. Um, and that could be sooner rather than later based on how this series may or may not go. I think Phoenix's goal is to get the hell out of the series as quickly as possible as it was before. Um, nothing has really changed for them. They're just going to level up on defense because that's what they're going to do. This series won't bother them. The next one yeah. very well could if Devin Booker is set to miss maybe three weeks or more. Yeah. So I think the SMA timeline right now is two or three weeks. And the Suns Pelican series can, if they if they drag it out as far as to a game seven, that series will end on April thirtieth. That's about a week and a half from now. Uh, so depending on who comes out of the Utah and Dallas series, Devin Booker, if they stretch that series out to game seven, they could Devin Booker could miss games one, two, and three. And if they clean up quick, then he can miss the entire series overall. So yeah, I can I agreed about you know, Devin Booker being desperately needed, especially in the second round. Now, there's another wrinkle that we all just learned pretty recently, like the other night. Zion's doing five-on-five five workouts, and so far he has cleared every single test by the team doctors so far. The only one test that's remaining is five-on-five five against the starters. Once he clears that, he'll be clear to return. Zion, if Zion makes it back to the lineup, how does that change this series? I think the Pelicans would win. If, if Zion's 90% of himself, then I think it becomes very difficult to contain Zion, Ingram, CJ, Valanciunas, Herb. That team becomes significantly better. Um, but you know what's even better? Don't speculate. We'll wait and see what happens because the whole thing with Zion has been speculation all year. He's supposed to be ready for opening day, remember, in training camp. <laughs> that was nine months ago or eight months ago. We're not going to do the Zion thing. That was so like th – We're not – yeah, we're not doing that today, okay? So let's like move on to the – pounds ago. Let's move on to the last thing we're going to do here today is uh, previous to the start of the NBA playoffs, all four of us made our finals predictions and finals winners. Listener, just to recap, myself, Shaban, and us have all picked Phoenix and, and Milwaukee to end up in the finals. I picked Milwaukee to win. They poked, both picked Phoenix to win. Kays went a little bit different and took the Warriors and the Bucks, and then he took the Bucks to win still. Is that is that right? Yes. Yeah. So we're going to give each other a chance based on the information we've taken in the last 10 days or so to adjust if we would like to. Um, so I guess, Kays, I'll come to you first since your two teams seem more healthy than everyone else, semi-related. Are you sticking with it? Do you want to adjust? Teams are going to stay the same. But I'm going to take the Warriors in seven. Okay, in seven. Very cool. All right, uh, Shaban, coming to you, man. You obviously, like I said, had Phoenix, 
and Milwaukee, where are you at? Are you still sticking with it? I'm still sticking with Phoenix. I am not sure about Milwaukee anymore. I think if they go up against Boston without Chris, presumably if they go up against Boston or hell, if if they go up against Brooklyn without Chris Middleton, I think they're going to get cooked. Like, I think, I think that Boston especially is a very strong team plays a lot of defense. uh, And we already talked about Boston. I just want your final picks, my friend. Who you got? I, I got, all right. I got, if, Boston makes the finals. I'll say Phoenix in six. Okay. Asad, what are you thinking? I think I'm going to stick with Phoenix. Uh, the Devin Booker injury is not that serious. I think he'll be back sooner rather than later. I agree with Chaban in that I'm, I'm hesitant uh, to now st- stay with the Bucks. I think the, the winner of that Celtics net series will make the finals. So I think, I think it's still Brooklyn. I think Brooklyn will pull this out and come out in seven. And I think that Brooklyn will make the run. So I'm, I'm going to pick Phoenix in six, but I'm going to go Nets, a Nets Suns final. I literally don't know what I'm picking. I have no clue. So I'm going to go with the two teams that I think have impressed me the most so far in the playoffs. Uh, I'm going golden state in the finals and I'm going Boston in the finals and golden state wins in six games. Sure. Let's say golden state wins in six games because they're just ridiculous. Um, Listener, I reserve the right for all of us to change these picks the next time we talk to you in a week because we're learning new things every day. Injuries are ruining the playoffs as they always do. Let's just hope that everyone stays healthy or as healthy as possible. In the meantime, thank you for listening to another episode of the Hoopologist Podcast. Hopefully you enjoyed the conversation with Pat and obviously with Shabon and Kay's rejoining us other than I. We'll see you next week. In the meantime, enjoy basketball. Stay safe and don't be a dickhead. See ya! Later. Peace. Bye.